Again. My name's Adrian Gilbert and if you're new to this channel please subscribe to it and press the little bell. I know everyone says that, don't they? But it does help, you know, the more people we have subscribed, the more likes we get. The further we get along to get into the first thousand, yeah, you know, I think it's about six hundred and ten or something at the moment, um registered people and, and we need to get over a thousand before YouTube start promoting the channel which is obviously what I want and not just for myself but I feel that this is information that a lot of people are going to want. Now today I'm going to be talking to you about um, the book of Daniel <coughs> and if you don't know what this is it's one of the books in the Old Testament of the Bible and before you sort of say oh my god you know that's just really boring uh, it's not. It's actually fascinating. It's probably one of the most interesting books I've ever read. And it, it's uh, because it's basically the most prophetic of all the books in the Bible, with the possible exception of the book of Revelation. And in fact, I'm convinced that St. John, who wrote the Revelation, was the reincarnation of Daniel. Now, I know that probably goes against your religious beliefs, if you're, um, you know, a traditional Christian, and that's fine. You know, you don't have to believe that yourself. Uh, it just seems to me that that makes logical sense um, of the way that things pan out in the two books and also in, in the way that Jesus treated John as his favourite disciple. But be that as it may, um, what is really interesting about the Bible itself is this whole notion of prophecy. It's the only book I know of which has this whole series of consistent prophecies made, um, many of which have actually already happened and come true, uh, but some of which definitely relate to our own times. And that gives us, you know, a stake in the game, as it were. <laughs> we need to know what, what the, the Bible is prophesying for our own times. But before that, we also need to know what it's said about the past and the framework that it works with, the framework of history, you could call it, uh, because it's not irrelevant. And I'm not alone in thinking this. Uh, I've got a book here. It's by Sir Isaac Newton, the famous scientist, probably the greatest scientist who ever lived. And it's called The Chronology of Ancient Kingdoms Amended. And he goes into the, uh, trying to work out the chronology of Egypt and Babylon, the Greeks. Uh, and he also goes into the, the temple of, of Solomon. You know, and there's even diagrams to do with it. And he also spent a great deal of time, it's not in this book, but in other works of his, writing about the book of Revelation and trying to work out exactly when was coming the end of the world. And I think I'm right in saying he, he came to a conclusion it was something like 2035, <laughs> which is not that far away for us, is it? Um, I don't know if he was right or not. Uh, but anyway, he was very, very interested in this whole notion of prophecy and what it can tell us uh, about our own times. So the book of Daniel is key to that. And I'm going to take us through it. This is just the first first lecture on this. And it's called The Times of the Gentiles. Now then, I'm going to read this out to you. In 604 BC, the Babylonians invaded Judea and captured Jerusalem. 
They established imperial control and demanded tribute from the Jewish king Jehoiakim. He agreed terms, but later sided with Egypt when he thought the Egyptians were stronger than the Babylonians. Babylonians, I should tell you, um, come from or came from Mesopotamia. Now I can show you here. You can see these two big rivers, Euphrates and the Tigris. Babylon was was there on, on the Euphrates River. And it was a great big city, around about a million people. The first mega city in the world, I think I'm right in saying. It might have been a mega city in China, perhaps. But certainly the only, or the first mega city uh, within the Middle East and, and the West. Uh, Judea was the home of the Jews. The Jews are the Judeans. And Jerusalem was their capital. So he took his army to Jerusalem and and captured it and implied and put terms on the king that he was meant to be his ally but when he he sided with the egyptians uh, that brought the babylonians back again and in 597 bc because king jehoiakim had broken his covenant king nebuchadnezzar who's the king of babylon returned this time sacking jerusalem Jehoiakim died in battle. His son, King Jehoiachin, confusing that, Jehoiachin as opposed to Jehoiakim, uh, along with the cream of the educated and skilled workers were taken off to Babylon. The prophet Daniel, <coughs> who came from a noble family, that's of the Jews, uh, was taken uh, was then only a, a teenager was among those taken so he's a, still a young boy teenager and he's taken off to Babylon Daniel was treated well by the Babylonian king who wanted to educate an elite a cadre of young Jews into the ways of the Babylonian Empire their names were changed and Daniel's being called Belteshazzar. At the time, Babylon was far and away the most developed city in the part, that part of the world. It was perhaps the world's first megacity, well I just told you that, with a population of over a million. To support this huge population, the Babylonians had very advanced agriculture, making use of the waters of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers for, for irrigation. There was a sof sophisticated system of commerce markets and systems for recording accounts right so they are a very developed society in addition the babylonians were great mathematicians and astronomers highly superstitious they employed many methods of fortune telling including astrology reading the livers of sacrificed animals <laughs> yeah that's I think that's called ex ex pistopy or pistopy or something like that, um, where they would slaughter uh, an animal, perhaps a, a, a young cow or, or or bullock, and cut it open and take out the liver and they'd look at it and the way the liver was, would be interpreted as a good or bad omen for whatever they were planning. <laughs> Sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? But they were very superstitious. Uh, their gods were many, with the local god being Bel Marduk. All of this was taught to Daniel, along with the languages of the region. He could then become an administrator employed to supervise the Jews. That was the plan. Now, in 586, after King Zedekiah of Judah had once more be betrayed them, the Babylonians returned to Jerusalem. Right, so they've now got a king called Zedekiah, and he's betraying them again to the Egyptians. So they come back again. This time they utterly destroyed the city, including the Temple of Solomon. They took from it most, if not all, of its treasures, including gold and silver cups. Nebuchadnezzar ordered the execution of Zedekiah's sons. 
Having been forced to watch them being their, this brutal act, his eyes were put out and he was taken back to Babylon in chains. There he died, the last recorded king of Judah. Most of the remaining Jews, those who had not fled to Egypt, were also taken away, leaving the land empty of people, virtually so. Now I want you to understand something here, that the killing of Zedekiah and his sons was a, a major act in terms of Bible history and prophecy. I'm not going to go into that today, but the, there was a prophecy that King David, you've heard of David and David and Goliath, he was king of Israel. Um, he was promised that there would always be a man to sit on his throne. Well, this cutting off um, <coughs> of the royal family, or the sons and the king, left the, the throne vacant. So it looked like you know, this was disaster time for the Jews, and it's a real insult to their belief that God would keep his promise to David that there would always be a man to sit on his throne. As I say, I'm not going to go into that, how they got round that, but that will be another lecture another time. Now, although King Nebuchadnezzar was then the most powerful man in the world, he still had a troubling dream. He therefore called his wise men and astrologers to interpret it. The catch was that he couldn't remember it himself. Nevertheless, he knew it was important and threatened to put them all to death if they failed to interpret it for him. <laughs> now imagine that. Um, you know, you've, the king has called you, he wants you to interpret his dream for him and he can't remember it to tell you. <laughs> what are you going to do? As none of the Babylonian astrologers and soothsayers could oblige him, Nebuchadnezzar became very angry. However, before he had them all executed, Daniel volunteered to help. He prayed to God to be given the king's dream, along with its interpretation. Daniel revealed the dream. He told the king, no wise men, enchanters, magicians or astrologers can show the king the mystery. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, i.e. the God of the Jews. He told the king his dream was of the statue of a man. It had a head of gold, its chest and arms were made of silver, its middle and thighs were of bronze, its legs were of iron. <coughs> Its feet and toes were partly of iron and partly of clay. The image was struck on its feet by a stone, cut by no human hands. All the statue was broken in pieces and swept away by the wind. That was the dream. Now we get the interpretation. So we can see the gold head, silver, the arms and the breast, the bronze, mostly the stomach and the hips, the iron, the legs, and then there's the feet, uh, iron mixed with clay. Now I believe that the image of the statue represents the times of the Gentiles. It is the time when, time when Jerusalem is in the hands of non-Israelite powers. How long is this? Now, I haven't got time to go right into exactly why I believe this, but you'll see how it works out. The generally accepted answer is 7 times 360 years, which is equal to 2,520. This is because 360 days makes up a prophetic year, and 7 times is the length of judgment for transgression. So... When you study the Bible, you get periods of sevens um, given as periods of, of judgment and punishment. It can be seven days, it can be seven years, um, it can be seven times 360 years. 
360, of course, is the number of degrees in a circle. And for the Babylonians, and later on the Jews in their prophetic calendar, that's the number of year, year, days in a prophetic year. And on the basis that one day is equivalent to one year, you get 360 years. I hope you understand that. So seven times would be seven times 360. During this period, Jerusalem would be under the control of Gentile nations, i.e. those not of the Israel covenant. This was punishment on Judah for the spiritual transgression of the nation, and especially by King Manasseh, who had practiced witchcraft and sorcery. Worst of all, he'd encouraged the sacrifice of children to Baal and Moloch. This idolatry brought God's judgment on the nation as a whole. So he was a king who had lived a little bit earlier than this, but God was really angry with the Jews over this, uh, this idolatry, this falling away. And in due course, they were going to be punished big time for sacrificing their children to Moloch. And here he says it, Behold, I am bringing on Jerusalem and Judah such disaster that the ears of everyone who hears of it will, t will tingle. And I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. And I will forsake the remnant of my heritage and give them into the hand of their enemies, and they shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies. So that's in the second book of Kings 12, 12 to 14. Manasseh was succeeded by his son Ammon, who was equally as bad. His son, Josiah, was one of the good, few good kings of Judah. He got rid of the idols and repaired the temple. Nevertheless, the damage was already done, and Judah remained under a curse. Now, this is very big deal stuff here, that if God puts a curse on you or on your nation, that's a <laughs> really bad scene. That's not what you want at all. And unless you can make some atonement and get that lifted, it's going to bring you big time trouble. And that's exactly what was now going to happen to the Jews. Now I should hear, say here, when I talk about Judah and the Jews, this is a smaller kingdom. It's not the whole of Israel. There's another part of Israel that uh, was in the northern kingdom that carried the name Israel. They'd already been taken away by the Assyrians and disappeared from history. We're left in the Bible with the state of Judah, uh, whose people are Judeans and known as Jews. Uh, right. Thus it was that in 604 BC, Jerusalem fell into the hands of the Babylonians. Right, so they're now going to be punished for 2,520 years. Sounds a long time, doesn't it? Now, the Babylonian Empire was famous for having much gold. It was brought to its, e its end in 539 BC. So the golden head represented the Babylonian Empire uh, under King Zedekiah and his successors. And that came to its end in 539 BC. It was succeeded by the Silver Empire, uh, which is the Medo-Persian Empire. So the Babylonian, uh, right, the Medo-Persian Empire, which succeeded it, would rule over Babylon and the Near East until 330 BC. For much of that time, it also ruled over Egypt. It is significant that the empire was sim symbolized by the arms as well as the chest of the statue. For Media and Persia were two separate kingdoms that formed a partnership, like two arms, right? So you've got the two arms. Uh, Persia was also famous for its silverware. So you've got the two arms. You've got the weaker arm, the left arm, I guess it would be. That's this one. And you've got the stronger arm, the right arm, which would be Persia. And between them, they were able to conquer Babylon. 
In fact, what happened was that they diverted the river and there was a, a, a bridge where the water would come into the city to water the city. And they diverted the river so that they were able to get in under this bridge and enter the city, you know, hardly having to do anything. And they were able to capture the city and execute uh, Belshazzar, as we shall see. Now, the third kingdom was the Bronze, which is the Greek Empire. Um, Medo-Persia was, was to be itself overthrown. Daniel witnessed the overthrow of Babylon, but he did not live to see the emergence uh, of this, this empire, which was symbolized by the lower torso and hips. That's the Greek Empire. So he saw the Persians, he knew the Persians, he was very good friends with the Persians by the end of it, but he didn't see the fall. Obviously, you know, 330 BC is over 200 years later. So anyway, the Greeks, the Greek Empire is bronze and that comes in at 330 BC. This empire was symbolized by bronze and it would be the Greek Empire of Alexander the Great. Right, so he conquered the Persian Empire in 330 BC. Alexander replaced Darius III as king of the empire, of the Persian Empire, in 330 BC. The Greeks wore bronze armor in battle, right? So that's, you know, the bronze was very applicable to the Greeks because they wore bronze armor. They're, it was still the Bronze Age then, so they had bronze weapons too. So, below the hips of bronze were legs of iron. This would be a truly formidable empire that would defeat the Greeks and take over control of not just the Mediterranean world, but much of the Middle East too. Importantly, it would be the next empire to rule over Jerusalem. It was Rome. So the Roman Empire took over control 27 BC uh, and in the west it continued until 476 AD and the last fragments of it in the east, Constantinople, lasted for nearly a thousand years more to 1453 when the, Turk, the Turks captured Constantinople and renamed it Istanbul. Again, it is fitting that the Roman Empire was symbolized by the two legs of iron. It was the first Iron Age Empire. Also in AD 286, the Emperor Diocletian divided the Roman Empire into two parts, East and West. Right? Finally, there are the feet and ten toes to consider. I should just say that the division of the empire is symbolized by the two legs. You know, the, the eastern leg and the, the western leg of the Roman Empire. The feet and the ten toes to consider. These were to symbolize the successor states to the Roman Empire, partly made from iron and partly from clay. They were to have some of the strength of Rome, but, like dried clay, would be fragile. The ten toes are to be understood as two groupings of five. One five would descend from the Western Roman Empire and the other from the Eastern, effectively ten provinces or states in all. Right, so we've got ten toes, ten states. Ten toes, ten states descending from the Roman Empire, five in the West and five in the East. We tend to forget about the Eastern Empire because we live in the West. At least I do. <laughs> Um, you know, we think about the Roman Empire, Rome, the fall of Rome. We forget that there was this whole other thing going on in the Eastern Bloc. And that a lot of the countries we now call uh, Muslim or Islamic were actually parts of the Eastern Roman Empire, especially places like Egypt, Judea, um, Turkey. These were all parts of the Eastern Empire at the, at the time of Rome. Right. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was flattered by the idea that Babylon, under his rule, was the golden kingdom. 
Accordingly, he had a gigantic golden statue made of himself. Oh, don't they just love their statues, eh? Everyone was required to worship this, but Daniel's friends, uh, Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego, refused to do so. For this they were thrown into a fiery furnace. However, they came out unscathed. Not even their clothes were singed. Right, so that's the famous fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar repented of his hubris and acknowledged that the God of the Jews was superior to all others. Right, now that's a big deal as well, because the local God in Babylon was called Marduk, and everywhere had their own local gods. And acknowledging that this God of the Jews is much more powerful uh, is a big, big thing for him to admit, uh, particularly as you know in Babylon itself. However, the story was not over for Nebuchadnezzar, right? So he's now going to get his punishment. Remember what I was saying? You get punishment, and it comes in sevens. <laughs> Well, he's about to get his, his punishment. He had another frightening dream. This time Daniel interpreted that it symbolised that the king would, for a time, become like a grass-eating beast. Right? He was going to, he's going to be put outside. He was going to he's, you know, grow you know, hairy with long nails like a beast eating grass and the dew of falling on his back. You know, that he'd lose his mind. Well, that's a pretty, pretty big deal. <laughs> and fancy having to tell the king that that's going to happen to him. <laughs> but sure enough, um, soon after, Nebuchadnezzar became mentally ill, thinking of himself as a beast. For seven years he lived outside, eating grass and living like an ox. Right? So he gets seven years punishment for his hubris in, with the statue. Eventually, after the seven years were over, he recovered his senses. Chastened by the experience, he repented and acknowledged the superiority of Daniel's God. Right, so he's now a changed man, <laughs> as you would be. Right, King Nebuchadnezzar died in circa 561 BC and was succeeded by a quick succession of other kings. Eventually Belshazzar, that's not to be mixed up with Daniel's name, Belteshazzar. Belshazzar um, is the ruler, he becomes a ruler of Babylon under his father who is the Ovra king. During the last year of his reign, before the fall of Babylon to the Persians, Daniel himself had a disturbing dream. Uh, Daniel lived to be a very old man. Although he never went back to Jerusalem, he lived long enough to see the end of the Babylonian Empire and its replacement by the Medo-Persian. This took place in 539 BC and was to lead to the return of a number of Jewish exiles to Jerusalem. But in his dream, Daniel saw four symbolic beasts that came out of the sea. And here you can see them all. Um, I'm very thankful to David Amer for letting me use these pictures. So if you're watching this, David, thank you very much. Um, and uh, we have here uh, I, Daniel. I, I put Daniel in there. To, you know, that's who we're talking. Who's talking? Saw in my vision by night, and behold. The four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The great sea uh, represents the sea of mankind, i.e. the many nations and peoples of the world. And that's quite frequent in the Bible, I should tell you, um, to describe peoples as a sea. These four beasts would appear to correspond, at least in part, with the four successional empires, gold, silver, bronze and iron, of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. So we're going to go through them now. And here's the first one. The first beast 
uh, likened to a lion with eagle's wings. And then I looked. Its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. A lion is a common symbol associated with Babylon. The lion has its wings plucked out off and is made to stand on two legs like a man. The mind of a man is given to it. This seems to allude in some respects to the experience of Nebuchadnezzar who became animal-like for seven years but afterwards regained his senses. He ended up acknowledging the superiority of Daniel's God over all others. All right? I think that's fairly obvious. Um, the prophecy of the statues started to prove correct in 539 BC. In that year, fiery writing appeared on the wall of the banqueting chamber where King Belshazzar was having a feast. He and his guests were using the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. In other words, they were committing sacrilege with the uh, the, the goblets the, and the tableware taken from the temple in Jerusalem, in other words, God's property, you could call it, and there they are carousing and drinking and toasting their own gods with these sacred vessels. I mean, this is blasphemy in, in the extreme. So you can expect that something nasty is going to happen to him. So the writing appears on the wall. Uh, the writing was probably in Hebrew, which the Babylonians did not understand. So they had to get someone who could read this writing. They couldn't read it. So they got Daniel in, of course. So when translated by Daniel, it said, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Upharzin, meaning you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Well, that doesn't look like a, an exact a literal translation, but I'll explain that to you. Um, the night the Medes and the Persians invaded Babylon, they took over power and Belshazzar was killed. Uh, those are Persians, Persians and Medes. The, the ones with the round headdress are Medes, I believe, and the ones with the sort of feathery uh, cap type thing sticking up, they're Persians. A tekel, or shekel, was a small unit of weight, and also later a coin. There were 60 shekels to a minna, or mena. Thus, if you put a minna in each side of a weighing scales, they would balance. However, add an extra shekel, though small in itself, this would cause the side to outweigh the other. This, I think, symbolises the alliance of the Medes with the Persians. Together they were powerful enough to defeat the Babylonians. The difference was small, but it was enough. In other words, the Persians on their own would probably be balanced by the Babylonians, but with the extra help of the Medes, they tipped the balance and they were able to, to win and take over Babylon. I think that's what it's all about. The Persian king was Darius. However, Cyrus the Mede was soon after put in charge as the local king of Babylon. Probably he had done something good in, in terms of the capture of Babylon, that he was trusted to take over the running of the city. So the city was actually under, initially anyway, under the control of the Mede, Cyrus the Mede. And the second beast is likened to a bear. It's raised up on one side and has three ribs in its mouth. It is told to rise devour much flesh. Now, this beast represents Persia, or Medo-Persia. Medo the beast refers to the Medo-Persian Empire. The raised up side is Persia, which was more powerful than the Median Empire that it joined with. So you've got one side, that you can see the beast here is lifted up on one side, is more powerful than the other side, this, uh, this bear uh, creature. And the three ribs would appear to symbolise Mesopotamia, including Babylon, and the Levant, uh, Babylon and the Levant, Egypt and Asia Minor. 
which included Lydia. Persia became a huge empire, devouring much flesh. Uh, devouring much flesh implies the absorption of many nations and peoples. So this was going to become a mighty empire, the Persian Empire. And I've put here the areas on the map, I don't know if you can see it that well, <coughs> that were subsequently conquered by the Persian Empire. Number one is obviously Anatolia, what we now call Turkey. Uh, that became part of, of the Persian Empire. We've got the whole area I've marked with the number two, which includes Syria and down to the Vaunt, which includes Israel, as we would call it now, and also Egypt, uh, stretching into Libya. So it stretched all the way from the Indus River in the east, right? So it goes all the way back to the river right down here in the east, uh, to the borders of Greece in the west. It conquered Egypt and part of Libya. The three ribs seem to be a reference to one, Asia Minor, which is Anatolia, two, Mesopotamia, including Levant, and three, Egypt. So those are the three ribs that it's chewing on. Daniel foresaw that the Persian Empire, the Achaemenid we call it, uh, would be relatively short-lived. Now I should just say here that uh, there was a second Persian Empire that came later called the Sassanian, which was actually in Christian times. Um, it was a revival of, of Persia. But we're talking here about the Achaemenid Empire, which had these kings like Darius and Xerxes, that you've probably encountered in history with their conflict with uh, the Greeks and fights with the Spartans, um, the Battle of Marathon Beach, uh, Salamis, the naval battle of Salamis, all of that uh, fought between the Greeks and the Persians. So this is the Achaemenid Empire. In a vision, you see symbols representing this. I saw in the vision, and I was at the Ulay Canal, which is near the Persian capital of Susa. I raised my eyes and saw and beheld a ram standing on the bank of the canal, and it had two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other. And the higher one came up last. I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward, no beast could stand before the ram, and there was no one who could rescue, could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. In other words, no one could stand up against the Persians. The Persian empires rushing north into Anatolia, going west into the Levant and Syria and south into Egypt. No one could, could withstand him, going eastwards, uh, all the way to you know, the edge of India through Afghanistan and all of that. Uh, the ram with two horns represents the Medo-Persian Empire, of course it does, which by then dominated the Middle East. It was to grow further after Daniel's time to take over Anatolia and Egypt. I've told you this. It would even invade Greece. All right, so powerful thing. Now, Daniel continues. As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came to the ram with two horns, which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal, and he ran, uh, ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him and struck the ram and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him. And there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Then the goat became exceedingly great, but when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and instead of it there came up four conspicuous horns towards the four winds of heaven. Right, so... Actually, oh, I should have shown you that. Actually, I think this uh, this ram with the one horn between his eyes uh, is the origin of our unicorn symbol, and it 
In its origins, it symbolised Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great ran at the Persian Empire. He just, he was just crazed. <laughs> it's the only way to put it. He was only 23 at the time. And he invaded Persia, this great empire. Um, went, crossed over the, uh, the um, what do you call it, the Bosphorus. Uh, the Dardanelles, in fact, crossed over there into Anatolia and began uh, chasing down, trying to get the, to the Persian king and bring him to battle and fought a great big battle at Issus, uh, which is just under the the armpit, if you like, of Turkey, <laughs> just around there. Um, and uh, he, called, he defeated Darius and then he defeated him again and he went down to Egypt conquered that and he was received as a liberator by the Egyptians and he went to the temple of Amun uh, in Egypt uh, <clears throat> at the Siwa Oasis and the oracle there told him he was a son of Amun which is their high god so thereafter he declared that he was a son of a god <laughs> and he went back to chase on to the Persian king eventually caught up with him captured all his wives and his daughters and his baggage train and the king fled and he was actually murdered um, by one of his own men. And Alexander actually treated the women very well um, and he, he then went on to go eastwards to, uh, to India and crossing over the Indus River and some of the tributaries of, of the Indus in the Punjab but his men were getting impatient. He wanted to go all the way to the other sea. <laughs> He'd go all the way to China if he could. But his men were, you know, it'd been 10 years since they'd left Greece and they were anxious to get home to see their wives. So he reluctantly he had to turn back. He went back to Babylon where he died. And after he died, his kingdom, his great one horn kingdom, was split up among his generals. And you get the four horns. Uh, which uh, successor states the he goat with one horn is Alexander the Great um, he was a man of extraordinary courage drive and charisma at age 22 he determined to carry out an audacious plan to invade and destroy the Persian Empire this would be vengeance for the Persian invasions of Greece when they had destroyed the Acropolis of Athens in a short campaign between 334 and 329 BC, Alexander completely destroyed and took over the Persian Empire. He even went on from there to invade northwest India. Eventually, his homesick troops insisted he turn back. He eventually died in Babylon in 323 BC, while still only age 33. I mean, <laughs> what a life! Alexander's body was taken to Egypt, where he was buried in the city he founded, Alexandria. His tomb was visited in 48 BC by Julius Caesar, who is said to have wept there. He was upset that he had not achieved as much as Alexander at his age. Caesar, however, was effectively the founder of the Roman Empire, which was to succeed the Greek. So isn't that interesting that Caesar went to Alexander's tomb and wept. Um, but he was going to be the one that was going to establish the Roman Empire. He didn't actually become the emperor himself, um, but he set it all up um, before he was murdered. And eventually it was his nephew Octavius who became emperor. Uh, but it's, it's interesting. And they've actually been searching for Alexander's tomb. It's lost. Nobody knows where it is. And every now and then you get reports, oh, they think they found a tomb in Alexandria. Could it be Alexander's? And then, oh, no. It's probably under the water somewhere because Alexandria had a big earthquake and a flood. And a lot of the, the old city is underwater in the harbour there. So it's probably down there somewhere. Alexander's empire was even bigger than the Persian Empire. As well as the lands of the previous empire, it included his home territories of Macedonia and Greece, as well as the Punjab region of northwest India. Right, so he's now got this massive empire he's built, uh, which is going to get split up. 
In Daniel's dream um, of animal images, the Greek empire is likened to a leopard with four wings and four heads. This is because Alexander had no heir. Thus, after his death in 323 BC, that is, his empire was immediately split into four parts by his generals. The four parts together comprised the Hellenic or Greek civilization, but they operated separately. Indeed, they are often at war with one another. One part was Egypt, one part was Greece, one part was Macedonia, and the fourth mutually uh, initially included Asia Minor, Syria, Mesopotamia, Persia, Afghanistan, and even parts of India. This huge kingdom did not hold together. It was soon reduced by wars and revolutions to just Syria and parts of Anatolia. So that's what we had left. The fourth beast was to be the most powerful of all. This was terrifying, dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped on what was left with its feet. And you see an image of it. Fourth beast was to be the Roman Empire. Well, we know that because the legs uh, come after uh, the hips and thighs of, or whatever it is of the uh, Greek Empire. Rome conquered what was left of the Greek Empire, including Egypt, Asia Minor, Syria and the Levant in the east. In addition, it grew a vast empire in the west. These were lands unknown to the other empires, comprising Italy, Spain, North Africa, Gaul, Britain, parts of Germany and the Balkans. The beast of Daniel's vision had ten horns which seems to refer to the ten toes of the statue seen in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. These are successor states up to the present. The statue had two legs, referring to the dual nature of the Roman Empire with its eastern capital of Constantinople and western of Rome. Thus five toes would be in the east and five in the west. This is important in the book of Revelation. Yeah, that's another book in the Bible which I've been doing i've been uh, making lectures on the book of revelation and uh, i should be continuing that but we need to do daniel first before we go further on in that series because it refers back to daniel quite a bit actually uh, and so we need to have this background groundwork as it were um, first before we get press on with that book Now, in 63 BC, Jerusalem was sieged and conquered by the Roman general Pompey. This was part of his organization of the East. In reality, Rome was busy taking over the Greek Empire, or what was left of it. Pompey later fought a civil war against Julius Caesar, but lost in 48 BC. Caesar went on to effectively end the Roman Republic. However, in 44 BC, he was murdered in the Roman Forum by conspirators. Yeah, I'm sure you know that. If you've, certainly if you've done Shakespeare's, you know, or seen the play or been in the play, I've been in the play of Julius Caesar. It's one of the conspirators. Uh, so he was murdered. After a second civil war, his nephew Augustus would become the first emperor of Rome in 27 BC. In AD 6, Augustus made Judea a directly ruled colony of Rome. Right? Prior to that, it was ruled by, um, as a client state by King Herod and uh, his uh, descendants. But the Romans, they, they didn't make it, or after Herod died, the Romans didn't like what was going on, so they decided to take it over themselves. So... Hence, we end up with people like Pontius Pilate as governor. And here's a map of the late Roman Empire. You can see it's divided in two. And you have a Western Empire and an Eastern Empire. And these are symbolised by the two legs of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And there you see them. 
In 324, the Emperor Constantine I founded the city of Constantinople, today called Istanbul. He made it this the capital of the East, with Rome the capital of the West. So you can see those feet standing on one on Rome and the other on Constantinople. The double-headed eagle was introduced as the symbol of the split empire. So you've got one eagle with two heads. So it's, you know the two heads are two emperors, one in Rome, one in Constantinople, but they rule a single empire, symbolized by the double-headed eagle. So you've got the double-headed eagle and the two legs, symbolizing this division of the Roman Empire. Daniel had a further prophecy concerning the fourth beast. From this beast, which is identifiable with the Roman Empire, would rise ten horns. These ten horns, echoing the ten toes of the statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, symbolize ten successor kingdoms. These would arise out of the ruins of the Roman Empire. And I've marked them here for you to see, and I've listed them. When the Roman Empire broke up, there were indeed ten toes or horns. These would appear to be as follows. And I've started at the top and I'm moving down. This is ne not necessarily their order of importance. One, Britain. Two, Gaul. That's France, you could call that. Three, Spain. Four, uh, oh, I call that three. No, it is actually four, Africa. That's North Africa, except for Egypt and that bit of Libya. Five, Italy. Six, Greece. Seven, Anatolia and Thrace. Right, so that's uh, what we call Turkey today, I guess. Um, eight, Armenia and Mesopotamia, or certainly northern Mesopotamia. Nine, Syria and the Levant, that includes Israel. And ten, Egypt. Right, so you've got five in the west, that's one to five, down to, from Britain to Italy. Then you've got five in the east, from Greece down to Egypt, which are from the Eastern Empire. Makes sense, doesn't it? Daniel's had a prophecy of a powerful kingdom that would arise after Rome. So here's his prophecy, as he says. However, as Daniel looks, he sees another horn emerge. It is small at first, but grows. It, consider, it considered the horns, and beheld, behold, there came up among them another... I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things, and that seemed greater than its companions. Right, so you can see there's the great horn that's got the face on it. <coughs> that's the little horn that sprung up, and it's ripped out three other horns, and... You know, by their roots. You can see those at the bottom there, placed on the ground. This tells us that three of the ten kingdoms will be overthrown by this new kingdom of the eleventh horn. This kingdom is not one of the ten. So what could it be, and who was its first king, the one who spoke great things? The per this person, or the person has to come after the Roman Empire, has devolved into ten regions. The end of the Western Empire is usually taken as being AD 475. A small part of the Eastern Empire carried on for nearly a thousand years afterwards, till the fall of Constantinople to the Turks in 1453. The Little Horn was clearly long before this, but after the fall of the West. Thus the horn seems to represent the sudden birth of the Islamic Empire. It is especially significant as it conquered both Babylon and Jerusalem. And the horn that spoke great things was a prophecy about Muhammad, who died in 632 AD. 
Now, I don't know if anybody else has actually come to this. Um, to me, this seems very obvious. Uh, but there are a lot. If you go on the internet, you'll find there are many other different interpretations about the horns and the, the little horn, and the, and a lot of them put this to the end of time. But I don't believe it is. I believe this is just after the Roman Empire, or relatively soon after, in 632 A.D., which, rising out of nowhere, we get the Muslim Empire the, with Muhammad as its prophet, and most especially. Um, the Umayyad uh, dynasty from Damascus who came just after him and they made major conquests. So here we have the late Roman Empire divided into its ten parts. Have I done that? Muhammad founded the new empire of Islam and waged war against unbelievers. He spoke great things especially against Jews and Christians. Within ten years of his death, the new Islamic empire had captured three Roman horns, right? and I'm marking them in here. Uh, horn number nine, Syrian de Levant, that includes Israel, AD 632 to, to 4, is when those areas were captured. And then there's the horn of Armenia and northern Mesopotamia, uh, which is horn 8, and they captured that between 638 and 9. And then there's the Horn of Egypt in AD 641. Right? So I think these are the three horns ripped out at the roots. And they've never, uh, well apart from Israel I suppose, um, ceased to be Muslim since then except for the brief time of the Crusader period. Some of it was Crusader lands. But um, by and large th Ever since then, those have been Muslim kingdoms or part of the Muslim empire. In addition, the early Islamic empire invaded Persia in AD 642. So this was all done within 10 years of Muhammad's death. And I want you to just think about that for a minute. This amazing empire grew up within 10 years from nothing. Nothing. Um, Nobody was expecting this empire to quickly emerge like this, this empire of the Arabs, who hadn't even been considered uh, by the Romans and the Persians and uh, everybody else. Uh, and yet suddenly this little horn comes from nowhere and it grows and becomes mighty and speaks great things and takes over initially within 10 years these three territories. Of course it's going to grow much larger than this. But I think this is what it's talking about in Daniel's vision, the immediate aftermath of Muhammad and his time. Uh, within 10 years of his death, these territories had all fallen to the Islamic Empire. Now, except for a brief period during the Crusades between 1099 and 1187, um, from 632 to 1917, 1917 Jerusalem remained under the rule of a series of Muslim emperors. Then on December the 8th, 1917, the Ottoman garrison at Jerusalem retreated during the night. The next day, the city was surrendered without a shot being fired. The British Field Marshal Edmund Allenby entered on foot on the 11th of December to take the formal surrender of the city. He made a stirring speech by the Jaffa Gate, declaring that the holy places of all three religions, Judaism, Christianity and Islam, were to be respected. Though under martial law, the people of Jerusalem were to go about their lawful business unmolested. In other words, there was to be no sacking of the city, um, no robbing of people, no rape, nothing like that. It was to be a very British conquest, uh, imposing the rule of law, um, martial law in this case, and people could go about their lawful business and, and their worship in their places of worship um, unmolested. Um, now this marked the end of the times of the Gentiles. 
and the start of the end of days. Now I'm going to explain what this means to you. Um, Daniel's dreams and visions mostly related to a period known as the times of the Gentiles. All of the empires mentioned here have one thing in common. They each in turn took over governance of Jerusalem. This is because the times of the Gentiles is tied with the period of 7 times 360. We mentioned that right at the beginning of this lecture, i.e. 2,520 years that reflected chastisement on Judah for idolatry. The chastisement began with the Babylonians, first taking Jerusalem in 604 BC. They were followed by the Medo-Persian Empire, which ruled from 539 to 332 BC. They were followed by the four-headed Greek Empire. It ruled from 332 BC. The first Roman Empire was Augustus, Emperor was Augustus, who started ruling in 26 BC. However, the Roman general Pompey conquered Jerusalem in 63 BC, so sometime earlier. At first it was a client state, but in 6 AD Augustus took over direct control and Judea became a Roman province with a governor. Jerusalem came under Muslim rule in 637 to 8 AD. As I said, except for a brief interlude during the Crusades, it remained under Muslim rule until December 1917, when it was captured by British and Australian forces commanded by General Allenby. I should add also there were some New Zealanders with them as well. So it was basically the core Commonwealth countries that conquered um, Jerusalem and brought to an end this period, marked the end of the times of the Gentiles. And I'm going to show you how that works. Uh, as there is no year zero, this was 2,520 years after the Babylonian conquest. So here we can see the times of the Gentiles. And this, I think, is not something that most people have come across. So um, it's very important for our time because, you know, we're talking about the First World War here. Uh, so you had Babylon. With the head, you know, we've got the Nebuchadnezzar, we've got Persia with Darius, Greece, Alexander, Rome with Augustus and Islam with Muhammad. Um, and then in 1917, we've got the British Mandate, which lasted till May 1948. Now, why is the British Mandate not included in the times of the Gentiles and that's a question I'm going to leave for a later lecture but the period of Jerusalem being under the control of all these earlier kingdoms uh, related to those symbols of the beasts and the horn um, ended that period of chastisement seven times 360 years ended in 1917 So what about the statue being hit on its feet by a rock and disintegrating? Yeah, that's a point. We haven't mentioned that yet, have we? Well, again, it brings us back to Britain. It's interesting that the 2,520 year period of chastisement was brought to an end by British, Australian and New Zealand troops. All three of these countries were in the British Empire at that time and therefore ruled over by King George V. He, like all British kings, was crowned while sitting on a special stone called the Stone of Destiny. It is said to be the stone used by Jacob, stroke Israel, as a pillow. Now you read about that in the book of Genesis. Uh, I forget exactly which chapter. I think it might be chapter 11. But, it's, you know, you read about, uh, basically, Jacob is running away from his brother. <laughs> and he gets to a place called Luz. And he finds a rock. And then he puts his head on it to sleep. And he has this dream of angels going up and down a ladder. And he talks with God. And he's told, you know, that he's going to multiply and he's, uh, not to worry. And he's... When he wakes up in the morning, 
he takes the stone and pours oil over it and consecrates it as an altar. So that's known as Jacob's pillow or pillar stone. The two names are used, pillow and pillar. Um, and that by tradition, and again, I'm not going to go into how this comes about. You might think this really weird. Um, the coronation stone of Great Britain is also called Jacob's pillow stone. And the legend has it that it was brought first to Ireland and then from there to Scotland and then to England. And now it's actually back in Scotland. Um, brought there from the Middle East by Jeremiah the prophet. Now again, that's a whole other subject and I don't want to go down that route. But isn't it interesting that those feet and the, the crashing of the statue is supposed to be done by a stone. Um, and it's a, some kind of holy stone, not cut by human hands, it said. So it's a sacred stone. And here we have the British are the ones who take the surrender of Jerusalem, actually without a shot being fired. Um, apparently they, the, uh, the British had aeroplanes, they had the first squadron of aeroplanes, I think, out there. Um, and they were buzzing, flying over Jerusalem. And people were very frightened, you know, this, that they were going to drop bombs on the city and destroy things. And the Turks calculated that it was time to make a hasty retreat. And they left during the night. On, I think it was on the 8th of December, they left. And the following morning, um, the, the Arab mayor of the city came out with two keys. Um, and he actually surrendered the keys of the city to a couple of cooks <laughs> who were out there foraging, looking for things to put in the, in the soup or whatever. And uh, they obviously couldn't speak Arabic. He couldn't speak English. And I, you know, he's waving his keys, you know, city keys, you know, ah, he wants to surrender. So they went and told their commanding officer and eventually the city was surrendered formally to General Allenby. Now those keys, are today in a museum in Maidstone, and I've seen them. Um, they're in the museum there, and I don't think they're door keys at all. <laughs> they don't look like they're the keys of the Damascus Gate and the Jaffa Gate. What I think actually happened was the mayor, or whoever it was, I think he was a mayor, um, grabbed the first couple of keys he could find, because he, he knew he couldn't speak English and they wouldn't speak Arabic. So he wanted to show them, look, you know, we're surrendering, we're surrendering the keys of the city over there. <laughs> and the keys are really symbols. But they, they are actually in the Maidstone Museum. You can go and see them there. Um, those were the West Kent Regiment at the time, or part of the London Regiment, I think. Uh, now there would be, but there were the West Kent Regiment, um, which incidentally my father was uh, first joined in the Second World War. Thought I'd put that in. Later on, he became an officer and he went out to Egypt and Israel um, uh, in the, in the uh, supplies, uh, an officer in the supplies division, um, bartering with the Arabs and other people to buy food for the Eighth, the Eighth Army that fought the Battle of Alamein. So, you know, interesting these little connections between today and all those years ago and General Allenby um, who's a great hero you know uh, he was made he he actually fought a battle at, at Mount Megiddo at the Armageddon of the Bible um, I don't think it's the Armageddon battle there's, there's another one coming but he was given the title of um, Viscount Allenby of Megiddo in recognition of that um, anyway, so great man and, and very interesting piece of history. I think you will agree. This stone is very special, as I shall explain in later lectures. Yeah, I've got a lot to say on that. I've written a whole book on the subject. It seems to be the stone in Nebuchadnezzar's dream that brings down the statue and hence does indeed terminate the age of the Gentiles. Now I should just point out here, I know I mean, Britain is desperately trying hard to escape from the EU at the moment, but at that time in 1917, 
Britain was coming up to its apex of the British Empire. It reached its largest extent just after the First World War. So it's this empire was it's actually the biggest empire the world has ever seen. Um, which included not just Canada and Australia and New Zealand and Britain, but also South Africa and large chunks of Africa, Kenya, uh, Rhodesia, and Egypt, even Sudan. Uh, they were client states. Uh, uh, India, of course, Burma, um, Iraq, Iran, Mesopotamia, uh, the Levant. These were all uh, these places from the First World War. Um, were protectorates under the British Empire. Um, so it was this vast empire. And it's very interesting that it's the empire of the stone and that the stone crushed the feet, brought the statue tumbling down in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And this actually corresponds with the ending of that period of 2,520 years, the period of punishment on Jerusalem. But we've got much more to say about all of that, and much more to say about Jerusalem, and much more to say about the return of Judah and the connection with 1948, when the Jews came back to uh, take over Jerusalem, or parts of it anyway, and, and the conquest in 1967 when they captured the old city. Very significant date as well. So lots more to talk about, and I hope you enjoyed this little lecture. Um... In part two of this investigation in the book of Daniel, we'll look at further prophecies. These concern the destiny of Judah, the advent of Jesus Christ as Messiah, and the end times. I don't know why I've written ten times. End times, that should be. The, not a T. So, thank you very much for your time, and um, look forward to speaking to you again. Thank you.